Right, ready, really. Right, ready, really. Good day, mate. 40 here. So how accepting, how comfortable are you with uh, other people's fallibility, right? So you make mistakes, and I'm sure you want other people's understanding when you make dumb mistakes. But uh, how do you react when other people make dumb mistakes with you? For example, uh, this morning I, I got an, an announcement at 9.46 a.m. Luke from YouTube, our team has reviewed your content. Unfortunately. We think it violates our terms of service. We have removed the following content. And uh, how your content violated the policy? Content that advances false claims that widespread fraud, errors, or glitches change the outcome of the U.S. 2020 presidential election is not allowed on YouTube. And I thought, that's funny. I've done all these videos denying, deriding, degrading, deconstructing claims of voter fraud, and now I'm giving, being given a YouTube strike regarding voter fraud. So I, I wrote back uh, on the, through the appeals process and I also clipped the announcement and posted it to Twitter. Within 10 minutes, the appeal was upheld and the, the strike was withdrawn. So I don't know about you, but I make dumb, stupid, idiotic, embarrassing mistakes all the time. For example, this week I got kind of snippy with, with people and uh, turned out I had no reason to get snippy. So I got snippy with three separate people and I got all pompous. I remember I, I was seeing this girl circa 1992. And uh, she'd come up to my parents' home where I was living. So she'd met my dad. And uh, I asked her, like, how would you compare, compare my personality to my father's? And she said, well, he's not as pompous. So <laughs> I got on my high horse this week. I got all, all pompous. And I was totally wrong. Just completely wrong. I, I just didn't get it. Uh, luckily, I was not as obnoxious as comes habitually to me. I, I was getting in trouble with this. I mean, the first time I entered school on a consistent basis, second grade, my teacher put it in my first report card. Luke is always very willing to share his opinions with the class, but he needs to learn to be more considerate of the slower thinker. So I, I've always delighted in using my brain to tear other people down. But uh, this live stream is a fantastic opportunity for me to make amends to people like Elliot Blatt. So instead of tearing down Elliot Blatt's commitment to natural foods and natural fibers, I'm now going to use this live stream to build Elliot Blatt up. So I'm going to build me up. I'm going to build you up. We're going to all have a Freilicher time. We're going to uh, celebrate Purim together. It's uh, Purim is basically the book of Esther. So... Esther, remember, she won, won a beauty contest, got to spend, spend a night with the king and uh, became queen. So it is uh, from the Hebrew Bible. It's the story of a Hebrew woman in Persia, Esther, born as Hadassah, but becomes known as Esther. She becomes queen of Persia, and she thwarts a genocide of her people. The story forms the core of the Jewish festival of Purim, during which it is read aloud twice, once in the evening, that's tonight, and again the following morning. So the book of Esther and Shira Shira and the Song of Songs, the only two books in the Bible that do not mention God. 
So I've been watching a lot of NFL films on YouTube. And I, I was watching a, a program on Everson Walls last night. So he was a, a Dallas Cowboys. He, he was a, a Dallas Cowboys uh, cornerback. So he, w- he wasn't drafted. He was, came out of Grambling. All right. And it was, a, I think, historically black college. And his 40-yard dash time, it was 4.71. Four points. I mean, that's terrible for, for a cornerback. So that's that's why he didn't get drafted. Now you might primarily know Everson Walls for getting beat by Dwight Clark in 1982. So I was watching this with all of my community. I was living in Northern California at the time. So January 1982, I was about four months into my first time at public school at Placer High School. And I gathered with friends and people in my community watching this game. The San Francisco 49ers turned the ball over six times. So earlier in the season, they'd beaten the Cowboys 45 to 14. So this is the NFC Championship game. The previous NFC Championship, the Philadelphia Eagles had laid the smackdown on the Cowboys. And the next year's NFC Championship game, the Washington Redskins would, would thrash the Cowboys this was the closest that the Cowboys came to getting back to the Super Bowl under quarterback Danny White. So the 49ers, half the team had the flu, and they turned over the ball six times, but the Cowboys still could not win. And on this famous pass, uh, Everson Walls there is looking up at Dwight Clark making the catch. So Dwight Clark was about four inches taller than Everson Walls. In December of 1985, I carried covered a San Francisco 49er versus Dallas Cowboys game at uh, Candlestick Park. And after the game, I went into the locker room, the 49ers locker room, and then the Cowboys locker room. And the entire Cowboys defensive backfield, they were all shorter than I was. I mean, often considerably, like four or five inches uh, smaller than I was. I mean, tiny little people, not like the Seattle Seahawks, and they're they're usually rather tall, strong defensive backfield. The, The... the Cowboys defensive backs feel universally smaller than I was. And I passed uh, Tom Landry in the hallway. And so I stopped and he was being asked about Skip Bayless. I think Skip Bayless had, had written some columns. Bayless was a, a column writer for a Dallas newspaper at the time. And Bayless had written some columns, I think, suggesting that uh, Tom Landry was suffering from dementia because Landry would call these slow developing plays at the one yard line. And you don't call... When you're, when you're on the opponent's one-yard line, you don't call slow-developing plays. You call very quick-hitting plays. And uh, on the other hand, he was calling these quick-hitting plays at like the midfield when you should uh, perhaps try something more elaborate. So he was getting confused. Ledley was calling all the 49er plays. So here, here was Tom Landry being interviewed the first time I encountered him, and he's talking about Skip Bayless. All right, he's saying, oh, I haven't spoken to Skip for like three years. That's what uh, Landry was saying in his, his slow Texan drawl. Anyway, here's uh, Everson Wall. Now, Everson Walls made the tackle. Here he is. In 1989, he left the Dallas Cowboys. He didn't like the new Jimmy Johnson regime. And so he went over to the Giants, which is coached by Bill Parcells. And he switched from defensive back to safety. So... Walls had gone undrafted, and he was slow, 4.71, 40-yard dash time, incredibly slow. But in his first season as a rookie for the Dallas Cowboys, he had 11 interceptions. So that was the, the 1981 season. And in that NFC Championship game against San Francisco, he made two interceptions. Right, two interceptions in one game, but he's perhaps best known for being posterized here by Dwight Clark, the super catch as the, the 49ers knock off the Cowboys 28 to 27. But of course, this reminds me of the Book of Esther and the Festival of Purim. So the Festival of Purim, the Jews get back at their enemies. Uh, The Jews thrash their enemies. The Jews slaughter their enemies in the tens of thousands. So sometimes in life, you're the Jews. Like this is Dwight Clark. He's the Jews in the Festival of Purim here, catching the ball. He's the winner. And uh, sometimes in life, you're Everson Walls and you're just uh, looking up as uh, <laughs> you're looking up at a face like Richard Spencer uh, as you're getting beaten down. Now, 
for the Giants in the January 1991 Super Bowl, Thurman Thomas was breaking away for a touchdown. And the only thing that stopped him was that Everson Walls, who was probably 40 pounds lighter than Thurman Thomas, uh, makes the game-saving tackle and and preserves the New York Giants' victory. So I think uh, Everson Walls vastly prefers this Sports Illustrated cover of him exulting after the Giants beat the Buffalo Bills 20 to 19, first of four Super Bowls in in which the the Bills lose. Like one right after another, they lost four Super Bowls in a row. First to the Giants, then to the Redskins, and then two to the Dallas Cowboys. So I, I love the the spiritual message here. Sometimes you're looking up at a face like Richard Spencer looking down at you, and then sometimes you're the face in the clouds looking down at uh, everybody else. Speaking of being Jewish, you know, this weekend was the big Yom holiday. Kippur, Yom right? Kippur. That's where Jews, where, this is the holiday where God really sits down, cracks open these books, looks over your life, and he says, hmm, all right, I'm going to let you live another year if you've been good. And this is the one where you fast, right? And you fast, which the idea, I think, is to keep your mind on God rather than anything else. Like you, you just you don't even stop to eat. You no. just think about God for 24 hours. Yeah, this is a huge final exam. All the <laughs> Jews pile into a temple. Nobody eats. Everybody's breath stinks because they're not eating. But everybody loads up before sundown. Right. Because I was visiting a friend out on Long Island, and the and we were trying to have an early dinner. Right. The restaurants were packed. With Jews. <laughs> Was Jewish city. And everybody walked in and said the same thing. I thought this place would be empty. <laughs> yeah, so it's a whole thing. Like, I know every Jewish custom and everything, but I don't follow them. Like, uh-huh. I was so indoctrinated as a kid. I had to go to Hebrew school every day after school, almost every day. And so what is in me now is I, I never got turned on by the religion. It was a horrible experience. <laughs> you know, the teachers were horrible. They were terrible people. I, I, they smelled. I didn't like them. Oh, I, I had one teacher who smelled so bad I couldn't take it. It got, I think it was his breath or his body. I don't know you what. You couldn't even determine which it was. You come up with Tzvi, Tzvi. They named me Tzvi. First of all, fuck you. My name is Howard. Why can't you just be Howard? Why do you have to have a separate name? They had name? to give you a Hebrew name. But why? Robin. <laughs> it, it, none of it made any sense. It made no sense. It made me anti-Semitic almost. I was going to say, I mean, it either is going to make you anti-Semitic or a multiple personality. Right. I mean, I got so resentful. I had to go to this Hebrew. First of all, I put a full day in at school. And I was no rocket scientist at that school. I was doing bad enough at that. And then to spend your entire free time in this fucking Hebrew school, learning a language. They didn't, it was ridiculous. I learned how to read Hebrew, but I don't even know how to translate it. So what's the point? You just spoke it? You didn't no, know what it meant? I speak it. I can read it. I can read off the Torah. But, but so what? I don't know what it means. It's not like learning Spanish where so you know the translation. Yeah. So I go in there. The first day, one of these teachers gives me a name. I remember the teacher, though. He wasn't such a bad guy. But he, but he was completely out of touch. He sits us down. And he goes, I'm going to give you all a Hebrew name. So we go to like uh, Mark. Mark, what? your name is Mendel. <laughs> which all the kids, which he really loved, because they started calling him Mental. Because <laughs> you're Mendel. Because Mark, he's Mendel. That's what, there's a translation. He goes, what's your name? I go, Howard. So his head almost exploded. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like, all right, you're Tzvi. How do you even spell that? Tzvi. And it's just, it's like, it's horrible. Tzvi. I mean, it's just a disgusting name, right? I mean, who wants to be Tzvi? Tzvi. Tzvi. You want to punch me in the head. Yeah, when you find, you know, you pick up some bacon. Tzvi. It's now I'm Tzvi. I don't have a hard enough time with girls. Now I'm Tzvi. <laughs> And then he tells you, uh, and then this temple was so conservative, it was a conservative temple, you know, which means it's hardcore. Yeah. And I don't know why. plates and yeah. everything. And my parents did everything wrong. I mean, you know, it put me in a conservative, I mean, what do I look like, Jewy Jewstein? Well, because they Jew, didn't but. practice conservative. Well, they went to the temple, but they didn't practice anything in the house. We didn't observe the Sabbath. <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm super Jew. They're not, I am. They're so fucking nuts. It was always you. You had me. to do everything. I have to go to the black school because we are not afraid of black people. I am afraid of black people. I'm afraid. Sorry. I don't want to get beaten up because you're trying to prove a point. I don't know what my mother was thinking. My mother's not an observant Jew. My father's not an observant Jew. They stick me in this fucking loony bin <laughs> of a town where now I'm going to temple, like a, a conservative thing every single day. Once you look at your kids and say, what the fuck am I doing? I hated it. I want to hang myself. <laughs> but he told me, you won't be bar mitzvah. And it, it's also based on superstition. You won't be bar mitzvah. Well, oh my God, I won't be bar mitzvah. I was so paranoid. I thought at 13, God visited you in your room and then he tells you the secrets of being a man. Because uh-huh. God knows my father didn't describe to me how to be a man. <laughs> I didn't know one fucking thing. I figured God, it's in God's hands. Oh my goodness. My father never sat me down and explained how things work. And the bar mitzvah is important. Why? Exactly. Why? Because you're, because you mean why? you don't know? I don't know. It's a, it's a covenant. To a, my father never once said to me, this is why I want you to be bar mitzvah. I'm proud of you for being bar mitzvah. You know? Okay, so I think most everything has substantial genetic origins. So I think some people just have a religious impulse and other people just don't have a religious impulse. Just like some people have a musical impulse. Other people don't have a musical impulse. Some people 
love to watch football. Other people, that's the most boring thing in the world. So uh, it sounds like Howard Stern is definitely one of those people without much of a religious impulse. Okay, so a little bit here from the book of Esther. So in the Hebrew Bible, it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. So there's no evidence that any of the events in the book of Esther actually happened. Okay, and so King Ahasuerus, the, the king of Persia, throws a big feast and he gets drunk and uh, he commands his assistants to bring his wife, the queen, before the crowd and to, you know, show off her beauty. So <laughs> he, he wants Vashti, the queen, to come before the crowd uh, naked to show off her beauty. But uh, she was not down with this. And so the king got really mad. And he didn't know what to do with his wife's contempt. And his advisor says, you can't let her get away with this because then all women are just going to disobey their husbands. So his advisor says, let there be a royal commandment go forth from you and uh, that Vashti, she will no longer come before you. And the king is going to give everything that she has to the new queen. But first, there's going to be a beauty contest. So let that all the young virgins be sought for the king. I don't know. Why did the king want the fresh, ripe peach? Why did the king want the old moldy peach that the dog has sat on? Like, why was it so important to the king to have a virgin? You know, why not get a woman with considerable skills who's been with like 40 different blokes? And then she can take all those skills that she's learned and she can share them with the king. I guess the king didn't want invidious comparisons between his own performance and uh, the other blokes. So he sent uh, officers all throughout his kingdom, gathering all the fair young virgins into Shushan, into the royal palace. And uh, they had uh, eunuchs looking after the women, and uh, they got all purified, and they got all cleaned up. And then every night, the king would get a different virgin. And he was going to just you know, plow his way through all these virgins until until he, he found the right one. So finally, Esther's brought before the king, and she's awesome. She, like, totally rocks rocks his world. And uh, the Bible is somewhat discreet. They say that she obtained kindness from, from uh, the king. Well, Esther goes before King Ahasuerus. Uh, she'd been sitting in this beauty palace for, for 12 months. And then she got all the purifications. She was covered with oil of myrrh. And six months worth of uh, being covered in sweet odors and other things for purifying the women. So I guess they got really douched. And uh, then every maiden came to the king, you know, for one night. And then whatever she desired was given to her after she'd done her maidenly duties. But uh, Esther came along and just totally rocked, rocked his world and uh, became real favorite of the king. We got uh, David coming along a little later to explain the story to us. No, gee, how do you feel about this? Or No, Did just you do like it. it. No, it, it didn't matter to him. He didn't look into things. He never looked into it. He, he, your mother raises you, not me. <laughs> what am I, a fucking dog? What am I, a pet? You got uh, for you're you? just my, here. Yeah, my, my dad didn't uh, sit and, and, and explore what might be going on in my life. It was my mother's place to do that. My mother was, you know, I don't know. I think she's whacked out. Why would she send me to a conservative <laughs> temple to go train every day to read fucking dumb Hebrew? What, it meant nothing to her. Why would it mean something to me? I could have been taking. I could have been fucking Jimi Hendrix instead of two hours a day in that stupid temple. I could have been two hours a day studying guitar. I would have been fucking Clapton Hendrix. They would call me Claptrix. <laughs> now I, I wonder. Let's say Howard got to spend that time learning Hebrew with a rabbi that he liked. If he was around people that he liked, then I think it would have been a totally different experience. So whether or not you stay in a particular synagogue or church, or if you're religious or, or not religious, I think a lot of it has to do with the kind of people you get to hang out with. Same with the uh, political orientation, right? A lot of it is just aesthetics. A lot of it is, you know, what crowd do you then get to hang out with? So if you've got half a dozen friends at church, it doesn't really matter what the church's doctrines are. If you've got half a dozen friends at synagogue, it doesn't really matter the ritual practices or the, the, the Torah teachings or the esoteric wisdom. None of that matters. If your friends are there, you're going to be there. So I remember once... At a modern Orthodox synagogue, the rabbi got up and he talked about how we'd all chosen him to be our spiritual leader. And I thought, what the hell? Uh, I never thought of you as my spiritual leader. This is just a synagogue where my friends are at. I'm here. I, I think very few Jews go to shul so 
that they can then anoint that that synagogue's rabbi is their spiritual leader. I don't know, maybe 5% of Jews probably consider their rabbi their, their spiritual leader. The, the primary reason Jews go to shul is to talk to other Jews, to be with their friends. That's, that's far more important than the spiritual leadership of the rabbi or talking to God. You wouldn't believe what I would be. But no, I studied a language nobody cares about. But quite frankly, people get killed for it. I could have studied fighting. I could have been, I could have been like a Chuck Zito. I could have been a, a, studying karate. <laughs> for two hours a day, if you're going to force me to do something, do something great. Useful. Useful. Something you could use. Yeah. Oh, and I come home from the Hebrew school so exhausted. And, go, and then the guy one day comes in, the teacher, and he says, this is the guy who named me Tzvi. He's not even the smelly one. I kind of liked him because he didn't smell. But uh, he, he comes in one day, and he, he says, uh, you're going to wear these underneath your shirt. Sit, sits. <laughs> now, li listen to this bullshit. It, really observant Jews, you know, like whacked out Jews. Like, you know, like real super Jews who obviously can't get through life without praying to something. Right, and, and wearing yeah. a costume. Right, wearing a co superhero costume. You wear these long sitsits. You know what I mean by No, sit -sits? I don't know what a sitsits really you know is. The Italicis, the, the, the yeah, shawl, yeah, yeah, and you, yeah, know yeah. Those, you know those um, on the tips of the shawl the Jews have? That it's a long... Long, these like... Um... Sitsits. Those That's are tzitzit. it? Those That's are called sitsits. <laughs> and so um, I come home, and now to go to regular school, I got to wear sitsits all day underneath... It's, it's, it's like almost like the Mormon si secret yeah. underwear. Or like, secret, yeah. secret sitsits. Life isn't hard enough for me. Now I'm wearing secret sitsits. <laughs> Do you know I would sit there and eat... You know, you're not allowed to eat pork if you're a religious right, Jew. Right. I'd eat pork chops with, your with my on. sits on. It made, it, it made no sense. Oh, and, you know, and now I think about it. My mother would go, ah, <laughs> look at you, sits it, smoke she it. Laugh. She'd laugh at it like I'm doing this. She's the one doing it. She had a paper for you ah, to go. Sits, sits, look at this, sits, sits, and he's eating pork chops. She's goofing on me for the fucking thing she <laughs> put she me in. But she made you the pork chop. Yeah. I'm telling you, I lived in a bizarre world. I had to get the fuck out of that house. <laughs> to this day, I don't know what happened to Oh, her. my goodness. Okay, things got a little testy on the uh, Duvid and Charles uh, Moskowitz show today. Uh, uh, if I conclude uh, that the politician that we had to buy off only did what we said because we bought him off, I'm an anti-Semite? Actually, that is an anti-Semitic conspiracy. It's anti-Semitic to buy off a politician to, uh, it is anti -Semitic to in order that they do things for the Jewish people in Israel. No, it is anti-Semitic to suggest that a rich that she said that the Holocaust made her feel warm and fuzzy. Do you think that was a nice thing to say? I don't think she said that. I'm Look it up. I, I Look her. it up. It was in all the media. I know it was in all the media, but I don't think she said it. You know, she, it's on tape. Go to yeah, your, I, mean, I know what she said. Like, yeah, I mean, you know what I mean, she said. And you think that reflects what she believes about Israel and about Jews? I think no, I it think, does. I, mean, I wonder why the media, by the way, didn't get into that about her. Instead, they're talking about the stupid comment made by that congresswoman from Georgia about lasers and something. You know, but but I mean, to me, that you know, to Lay's attitude is much more harmful and much more dangerous and much more hateful. But anyways, well, says, so, says, says, says the white Jew. That's first of all, you don't know my racial background. And secondly, as a Jew, I know when I hear anti-Semitism, I can smell it. No, you don't. Oh, yeah. As a Jew, you have no special authority on knowing what anti-Semitism is. Like any other is. Jew, I can. No, I you, can you, there's a, if there's anti-Semitism, you as a Jew, no, oh, I'm a Jew. I know that like that's extremely dangerous and it's dumb. How as a Jew do you have some special sense just, about anti-Semitism? What, what logic do you the have? Same How way do you know? that if I were black, I know what racism looked like. You know, it's it's kind of an instinct. And, and by the way, I use that term very carefully. I don't claim that, you know, in this sense, I actually agree with Dr. E. Michael Jones, who says that groups like the ADL, they'll call anyone an anti-Semite if they don't go out of the left. Wait, you know, you, you're calling me an anti-Semite here, and you know I've been more than you have. You're looking at someone is, who's done 100 times more for Israel someone who you, takes, and you're still calling me an anti-Semite. Someone who takes a position. You know that I've done way more for Israel, and I still call me an anti-Semite, right? You just call me an anti-Semite, even though I've done way more than Israel for you. You sound like you're spouting exact things that I hear coming out of Hamas and about the radical left who is anti-Semitic. Now, I don't know. But you say I should keep this secret. If I help Jews raise a bunch of money and donate it to politicians in order that they do. Well, then why are you spouting Hamas as party line? What, so I mean, let's, let's, if you're so pro-Israel, why, why are you spouting, you know, atrocity propaganda against the state of Israel and, and, and emphasizing negative and this business about the rich Jews is why the United States supports Israel? This is classic anti-Semitism. I mean, one thing, one thing, if, if uh, Charles does not speak on behalf of money, um, people are better off. Apparently you if, do. If, if, well, well, yeah, I mean, that's probably why these people want to speak to me, not you, because you can't write a check. You don't know I anyone who writes a check. Duvin knows, Duvin knows a lot of people who write big checks. Oh, good for you. I don't write a check, but you're saying you don't know anyone who writes big checks. That's probably why these people want to speak to me, not you. I mean, you agree? Well, I don't know what the hell. All I know is that you are spouting classic anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. The rich Jews telling you I have a bunch of rich Jews friends that write big checks. Americans I'm a classic anti-Semite because telling you I know a bunch of rich Jews that write big checks that makes me an anti-Semite. Yeah, but the, it's what you conclude from that. I don't doubt that they were. Uh, but if uh, I conclude that the politician that we had to buy off only did what we said because we bought him off, I'm an anti-Semite. Actually, that is an anti-Semitic conspiracy. It's anti-Semitic to buy off a politician to. Uh, it is anti-Semitic in order that they do things for the Jewish people in Israel. No, it is anti-Semitic to suggest that a rich Jew is why Americans and American politicians support Israel. Yeah, I say that's anti-Semitic and it's false. Well, what if it's true? What, 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 meeting we were there and we wrote a really big check and the person said we're gonna do what you said there are people who write big checks for a lot of things that doesn't mean that that's why they support israel they support israel because american people support israel and they want to get reelected. It says a man who never wrote a check it says a man who looks at the gallup polls and looks at every yeah, single man poll who never wrote a check so you're, what you're you, saying, and how do you explain the fact that the gallup you're saying that you're saying that they do support, it, it shows moral. that the vast majority of americans support israel. you're saying you're saying that the, and that if the they do they're not doing it because they think it's the moral and this and no i'm saying they're doing it because me and a bunch of my friends raised a bunch of money 
and, uh, and, and legally bribed them. No, I'm saying that the like, politician like, is doing it because they want to get elected and they look at the polls, they look at the Gallup money, and, and they say, wants to get the vast majority of people money. support Israel and I want to get elected, so I support Israel. Whether they personally do or not is almost beside the point. Politicians do what they have to do to get elected. Sure, Israelis contribute money to them, or Jews. That's not the main reason. They want to get elected. The mayor of Boston wants to get reelected. If he came out against Israel, he wouldn't get reelected because the vast majority of people in the city support Israel. Yeah, but it's just that's why they, what they're responding to. Look, I happen to know something about this, David, because I ran for Congress. I know a little bit more about it than you. Politicians take a look at- I support triangul- Trump who doesn't back loser. I appreciate you running for Congress, good man, but like Trump, I'm going to back the winner, not the loser. They triangulate when they run for office and say, this group supports this and that group supports that. So here's what I'm going to do because I want to get elected. I'm not saying I did that, but I'm just saying the most- You lost to a gay Jew, right? You're less popular than a gay Jew. What are you talking about? I mean, most didn't politicians- Barney Frank, Didn't Barney Frank destroy you? Yeah, but the, so what? The point is that I'm talking about my experience of being on the inside of this thing and you seeing- You got destroyed by Barney Frank? You're saying like that's, that you're gonna put that on your resume? Yeah, but I don't think that Barney Frank was destroyed me because he's a gay Jew. I think he was, he destroyed me because he's a big liberal politician and a cult figure in Boston. And that's hard to take on. The point is that, you know- I mean, What about Sheldon Adelson, all the money he gave? And he clearly said he wants you, I mean, his policy were clear. Sheldon Adelson gave money and he made one demand and it was about Israel. And you're taking all these Republicans that Sheldon Sheldon Adelson gave this huge amount of money to, they didn't actually do what they did for Israel because Sheldon Adelson gave them the money. They did because it was the right thing to do and they just gave the money because why why not? And you're saying like, no, they did it because he wrote them the checks. And you are spitting in the face of the Jews who wrote those checks by saying what you're saying. No, again, I didn't say that they did it because it's necessarily the right thing to do. Although I think- They did it because because they wrote those checks and you're spitting in the face of those people who wrote the checks. They want to get elected and the vast majority of people support Israel. If the vast majority of people did not support Israel, then there'll be no amount of money that could make that make them support Israel. They're going to do what they have to do to get elected. And the vast majority of people support Israel in the United States. Now, that may change in the future. I don't think it will. But the fact is that that is why they do it. Now, the fact that Jews lobby them and give them money, you have lobbyists from all sides giving money and you know, trying to get different things to happen. The fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, the politician has to get elected. They have to look at their constituency. They have to ask what the constituency wants, and they have to give it to them or they won't get elected. That is yeah, how so that's why Biden, that's that why is Biden's not going to sign the letter. And that's why Biden's not going to sign that letter. What, what does that have to do with it? Because we said yes. Look at his constituency, how he got elected, and his constituencies do not want him signing that letter and covering up for Israel's uh, secret right, nuclear. He won't sign it. Fine. The point is, first of all, Biden's poll poll numbers are less than fifty percent, and secondly, we don't want to talk about how he got elected because I'll get kicked off YouTube. Putting that aside, he is going to be pro-Israel ultimately because other, every American president has been since Truman because that's what the American people support, not because of some anti-Semitic. Because, because his grandkids, because his grandkids are Jewish, not because like, it's, it's his own self-interest. Because his grandkids are Jewish. You're saying because he's going to do it because it's morally right thing. I didn't say that. He's doing I that because he looks at his that. Jewish grandkids and wants to keep them safe. He said it himself. He's doing it because of his own Jewish Whatever. blood. Charlottesville. He's scared. He's scared that for his own Jewish grandkids. Good to him. I don't know if he's doing it for because he morally supports Israel. Some politicians do and some don't. He's doing it because politicians again. He's doing because he's scared for his own Jewish grandkids. You're right. rejecting maybe that. That I that I commend him for that. But the point is that politicians ultimately respond to what the American people want because they want to stay in office. Okay, let's uh, welcome uh, Duvid uh, onto the show. Duvid, that's a great show you did with uh, Charles Charles Moskowitz. When, when did you do this show? I'm not... Why am I not hearing Duvid? Oh. Um, Okay, let's see. It's probably on my end. So let's check settings. There's my microphone. Let's be, okay, hang on, David. It's on my end. Let's go with this. Okay, David, try again. Uh, test, test, yep, happy yep, form. Okay, yep, yep. I can hear you now. Thank you. So, um, okay, yeah, uh, David, that was a great show you did with uh, Charles Boskowitz. Tell, tell me about it. Oh, can I just ask real quick are you live on YouTube? Yes. For some reason, my YouTube is like being blocked or something. I just yeah, no, you. YouTube's really weird lately. Uh, I, I don't know why. I'm like searching, I'm putting your name in, and uh, it's just not showing me that you're live. I'm clicking on your page, and it just won't load. I don't know if anyone else is having that problem, but okay. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, every Thursday, I've been talking with Charles for a few months now, and, and uh, I saw the news today about this possible letter that uh, Biden's supposed to sign about covering up for Israel's nuclear program that he's hesitant to sign. So we were just talking about it and kind of like devil, devil's advocate, uh, Charles was given like the Hasbora, um, you know, like general, like, yes, America should do everything for Israel and not because it's a favor to the Jews, but because it's good for America. And I was kind of you know, given the devil's advocate where, where it's like, I don't even, you know, like America might control Israel. Oh, they might just be bluffing. There may not be nuclear weapons at all. Um, but I thought that was a good discussion leading into uh, Purim. 
Yeah, so Purim is one of the, the happiest of the Jewish festivals. I, I have many happy memories of Purim, starting off with, say, my first memory of celebrating Purim with the community was at uh, Synagogue Ohev Shalom in Orlando. And it's a conservative synagogue, and there's just so much joy in the room. It was a month before I moved to Los Angeles. So this was late February 1994, and uh, just a wonderful time. There, there are many fun customs. People dress up on Purim. There's, there's a lot of uh, singing and, and dancing. Uh, people give each other gifts of food. There's a, a special Purim suda, a special Purim meal. Uh, do, you, do you have any memories of Purim that particularly stand out for you? Yeah, I mean, my first major Purims were in Israel because you know, I became a, a Boltruva largely through going to Israel. And, and uh, you know, so in Israel, it, it, you know, just like it was almost mayhem. It, it, you know, like, uh, you know, I'd grown up in Detroit, been to stadiums and bars. So it wasn't, uh, you know, like I wasn't scared or anything. It was, But uh, just like everyone got trashed, like drunk. And, and, and uh, yeah, I, I was kind of joking with Luke. Everyone turned into a charity collector. Like all of my friends, everybody in yeshiva, all of a sudden, uh, you know, like it's Purim. And uh, I think I was in Israel a good few months from Purim. Uh, before I'd really celebrated Purim uh, for the first time. And I was already in yeshiva and I probably, you know, tried to learn through the Talmud. There's a Masecta on you know, Megillah, so I knew what was coming. Um, but if you're in Jerusalem or Borough Park, uh, you know, Brooklyn, you know, may maybe London, probably LA also, but not the same as, uh, you know, like uh, Brooklyn probably where you have uh, Hasidim and, and it just becomes a completely different world. It's a festivity. And uh, if you're in more orthodox areas, the charity collecting becomes immense. Like that's one of the main things of the holiday. And also the shell of manas, this idea of giving gifts to the poor. So, uh, you know, you go to the houses and visit all your friends. And there's really no other time like that uh, in Judaism. You're saying you just knock on people's doors and, you know, like, it's Purim, I'm here. And you're like, make a bracha and you give shell of manas. And like, so I remember the first Purim in Jerusalem, I went to like everyone I knew's house, all like I'd been there a few months and I probably eaten at like 10 different people Shabbos. And uh, I went to all of them basically and just gave them Shalak Manas. And, you know, as you get to know more, more and more people, but so uh, it's probably the most festive, fun Jewish holiday that, you know, the theology behind it. And I mentioned to Luke, uh, you know, in the chat about uh I never had it into me to collect for charity, it's, but by saying you're supposed to collect for charity and you're supposed to give to the poor and to people who need. And so generally, like if you pray to pray with each other every day, you might not know, but like some, you really could tell sometimes who's in need of help and who's not. And poor is the time to have a more festive, generous uh, spirit. So if you're like modern Orthodox and you're in a place where everyone's supposed to be upper middle class, and uh, you know, so if you fall under that status and are need a help of money, uh, it might be within reason that you know people wouldn't know about it, and, and it would largely be kept secret. And uh, you know, people might, uh, but in the more orthodox culture, <coughs> usually the people with needs are more known. Like you know, there's families, there's people, and uh, you know, so poor and people become really generous or. You know, like generally in Orthodox culture, getting married is a really, really big thing and collecting money for people getting married. So, you know, according to Torah, you're required to help them. Like even Luke Ford or, or Duvid during our down times, you know, if we're working for a tiny bit of money and someone comes up like, you know, I'm trying to get married, uh, I'm collecting money, um, you're really required to give them. And uh, all, all these things. So for them is the time like you're allowed to beg you're supposed to beg and the bigger player you are is directly seen by how you publicly give away money and so like in the orthodox culture saying like jews like generally people keep it on the down low of how much money they have like there might be certain people that have like big houses or nice fancy cars or whatever that will flash you with money um, but like generally in the jewish community people keep how much money they have like somewhat on a down low and the people who have larger sums of money 
um, you know, probably don't want all that many people uh, knowing about it. But like Quorum, if you want to be a player, uh, I don't know if you, you know Luke will validate that he's seen this in LA. Uh, I've sat at many people's tables, like you know, saying people will set up stacks and stacks of money. And if they're rich, they might be $20 bills, some cases $100 bills. That's very rare. Most people dollar bills. Um, but like you're saying, like anybody who comes and asks, I'm going to give money to. And, you know, if it's only, you know, like Broke Hashem, I was able almost every year to give at least a dollar. Like since I started working, um, you know, like even if it was a few hundred dollars. So when I was in Brooklyn, I would go to the bank and get like uh, hundreds and hundreds of $1 bills. And in fact, I used to get like 50 cent pieces and dollar pieces and $2 bills. And say, like, I remember one year I gave away $4,000 on Quorum and it was fun. It was like the funnest thing I ever did. It was very fun. Like, cause the Quorum people were collecting and I had like some success in business and like literally for like hours, I was just like, whoosh, whoosh, like $20 bills. And it's saying like, uh, you only see that on Quorum and like, like if you're a little Jewish kid, like that's your, that's that you're like saying there's like, you want to be a rapper, but it's saying like, I want to be rich. I want to be that guy handing out money like that. And Forum's really the one time a year you may see that. I don't know if Luke, you've had similar experience like that. Yeah, it's a time of uh, great generosity. Now, I mean, there's an exuberance with which uh, Jews celebrate a lot of their holidays and uh, the way that they wear their emotions uh, on their sleeve compared to Anglo-Saxons. So I, I don't know how much experience you've had with uh, wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, but uh, they don't tend to get as rowdy, certainly not with their religious celebrations as, as Jews. So for I've people, met hundreds or thousands, but I've never lived in a place where they were anywhere near a majority. You know, like they were probably, the, one, the wasp I've met lived in places where there's more Jews than they are. Well, these parties are, I always thought he was setting me up for Right, so... What, what about my point that there's a raucousness to the, the ways Jews celebrate that uh, you don't usually find among more button-down Christians? Yeah, I'm saying like Luke may have never experienced it, but if he went into shul on Purim, some drunk dude would have his, shoulder, his arm around his shoulder and be like, you will sing, you will dance, you will not leave synagogue till I make you sing and dance. And like there would probably be someone on his shoulders like in the video like rabbi botaic is on the shoulders of cory booker like there would be some cosset on the shoulders of luke ford like that oh yeah no that's that's uh pretty normal in in chabad though in in modern orthodoxy well, only they... on forum though I mean, not, 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 maybe at a wedding but they like, really only on forum that would happen uh purim a wedding I'm trying to think if oh uh half torah i mean on simchat torah there's uh Tremendous amount of uh, drinking and celebration as well. Yeah, but it's, it's not like you know, like you don't have like random casitum jumping on your back at, at uh, you know, m maybe if you were in like Crown Heights, but it's like it would only be forum or an event where. But it's saying Jews and especially casitum dance and have simcha like this pretty regularly, not like every every day or even every week, uh, but every few months. But if you're even if you're like a yucky, even if you're the most conservative of all Jews, it could be like this in your celebration in Purim. Saying like, like it's it's what the text says, the text clearly says in the Talmud, Adelayayda, Adelayada, until you can't tell the difference between Mordechai and Haman. So even like the most modern Orthodox or in, in like reform synagogues, you know, they don't like people getting, if they don't like people getting drunk there, you may, maybe they don't have a celebration or, at all or no alcohol, but it was saying like, this is Purim, this is what it says in our books, and you could reasonably expect to find this among any group of Jews on Purim. Uh, yeah, but there's a, a huge difference between Hasidim, Mitnagdim, so Hasidim, Mitnagdim are the kind of anti-Hasidim in orthodoxy, the, the modern orthodox, conservative and, and reform, there's just enormous amount of difference in the spirit with which they they celebrate so the hasidim are the most emotional in in their celebration like the, the modern orthodox are incredibly restrained compared to the hasidim just as even the way modern orthodox celebrate purim uh, will will appear exuberant to typical uh, european christian eyes and then conservative and reform you know far more buttoned down than even the modern orthodox so they're a pretty 
drastic and graphic variations in emotions between Asetum and everyone else when it comes to Purim. I mentioned this too because it's Purim and there's a Carlina Rebbe in Los Angeles. Maybe you or some of your listeners, the Carlina Rebbe's son went out to California like 10 years ago and opened up a base madrash. And Carlin Stolen is one of the larger uh, Hasidices of Russia. They, they pronounce their words like Litvax, um, light features in general. Um, and they're known for yelling during davening. But in Jerusalem, they're, they're very big. Carlin Stolen, there's maybe even t- over 10, 20,000 Carlin Hasidim in Israel. And th- they're one of the larger groups in Jerusalem. And the Rebbe on Purim pours huge cups of this, what's called Sheva, 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 which is really just like some cheap whiskey. It's like, it, it uh, almost made me throw up just to smell it. And I remember waiting in line, and the Rebbe literally poured me like half a cup, like four or five shots worth of Sheva, Sheva, Sheva. And uh, it was like it was like a mosh pit. And as they like, and and uh, and they do it every year, even in Brooklyn, and it uh, you know the custom goes back hundreds of years. But really, all Kasidim do. It's called the shikertish, and uh, you could see the like from an anthropological perspective the camaraderie, you know, getting so drunk and everybody dancing and singing with arms around each other. That that is uh, you know somewhat like the cultish tight knit uh, culture of Hasidim, but even Jews in general. And mentioned like if you went to a liberal synagogue, like certainly in Detroit, we had alcohol, and you would probably have like an African American um, convert to uh, Judaism putting his arm around you, like like Shmuley Boteak, because that I mean that'd be the dynamics in Detroit. But but uh, yeah, it's possible and likely. Now, actually, to have chanting, you really need chanting, and you can't have singing without that, without like chanting, and if no one can get the people chanting it's not going to really happen like sometimes you could just like put on a dj um but like it, so in modern orthodox you you need a band really um you know and i used to promote jewish music but it's like if you have a band uh you're like on holidays like jews will get like that that's what we do like you know some, not all jews some people are more a recluse and, and uh you know like luke's been doing dafiomi i've been i've done dafiomi i've learned mastecta megillah multiple times it says some crazy things there in uh you know like uh some of the theology insights of like what it really means to be a jew comes from megillah and and even like anti-semitism i was saying from a healthy orthodox perspective Purim is basically the holiday to think about anti-semitism you don't need to think about it all year really Purim is uh you know like you could dress up you could deal with these issues, get drunk, let it out, and then you got to go back to work. And uh, you know, there's a certain nature to uh, I don't know, call the utility from like a group strategy of Purim versus like the theology of uh, a lot of times. You know, the Gemara itself says that you know a lot of statements. Uh, uh, Niknas, Niknas. Uh, I forget the exact uh, Aramaic, but like when you enter alcohol comes out uh, you know the secrets and there's another statement like anger money and alcohol releases people's secret but, but i mean there's reason like getting drunk has a value and it's religiously controlled but you know i saying that there was just a survey they put out in uh, jewish papers that actually yeshiva high school students have a worse alcohol problem than even the goyim in like a, a certain area they did a study and alcoholism was actually higher among uh, orthodox jews than um the goyim but there is the utility to uh to that 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 uh, was well known in the talmud and uh if you're Hasidic, they might you might you know somewhat be required to get drunk and that's saying like a health reason or uh you know they're usually careful they have it solo and like very rarely do people get injured on, you know, i'm sure like even every synagogue on Purim has like multiple hot members i remember i threw up like this guy actually threw me up once actually and carlin stole and stuck his finger down my mouth and forced me to throw up um but i say like so it's not like uh haphazard where people are doing stupid things or going to get injured um but uh, it's like yeah there's a utility to that and uh, the talmud talks about it the the torah talks about it 
Yeah, it's a crazy time. Now, modern Orthodox synagogues are increasingly alcohol-free, precisely, precisely because of uh, the downsides of, uh, of teenagers getting drunk. So it's very common for uh, Orthodox Jewish kids, uh, teenagers, to get together with their Rebbe, and, and uh, the Rebbe will get them drunk on Purim. And these are 13, 14, 15, 16-year-old kids. So the modern Orthodox have responded by increasingly modern Orthodox synagogues are alcohol-free on Purim, which uh, an alcohol-free Purim seems like a contradiction in terms. Yeah, so ironically, <laughs> modern Orthodox synagogues usually have very good kiddish clubs and you know alcohol. But yeah, I think even the ones here locally are probably alcohol-free on Purim. And you know, they, people they don't need to get together. People don't need to get together in Purim on the you know synagogue to get drunk. You know, like you, especially modern Orthodox people are usually, you know, upper middle class and have you know nice houses to uh, get together to uh, do that. As where in the Orthodox, um, it would be more likely that the whole congregation would get together and, and drink. Like so, if you're, I mean, there's pictures. I, I used to put them up on my Facebook of just like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of empty wine bottles. In fact, you know, like Jews, you know, say like medicine, but uh, um, Jews historically are very famous for for uh, winemaking and quite good at it. And even some of the best wineries you know, in Europe were at least owned by Jews. Some of them even uh, mas mastermind uh, by Jews. Wine is part of uh, our religion like that. And, and the kids that we, in Brooklyn, you had religious exemption, like, you know, saying like, we're, 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 we're Jews. This is part of our religion. Um, we're going to give our kids uh, alcohol. And, and uh, I'm not sure the exact law and uh you know to crack down on that and most places in the u.s will recognize religious exemption uh, a lot of chabads get in trouble because like a lot of chabads have you know like it's college and people like to get drunk and chabad they have for brangans and like to drink and there could be god forbid a lot of underage drinking some chabads will get an exemption though that it's a religious gathering and yes like i'm a jew and even though there's a 21 limit uh, age limit uh, as a kid that my parents have okayed it and the rabbi has okayed it and it's part of my religion. If you're a Chabad, I mean, I don't know if you followed that, but I think there's actually been court cases and, and back and forth with uh, Chabad houses and alcohol and minors from a, a legal level here in America. Yeah, yeah, because whenever you have uh, drunkenness, particularly public drunkenness, you often have... Uh... Uh, some unfortunate uh, consequences. So what is, is your relationship with alcohol? How how drunk have, have you been getting on Purim? I used to get really drunk on Purim. Like I used to, you know, get drunk nearly to throwing up. And I, you know, because I really wanted to lose myself. And I mean, in, in Israel and Yeshiva, and I said there were, there were doctors and people who was and like, I, I never had a health risk on Purim. And there was always plenty of people around, uh, um, and, and that's why I said there's a different, like you're in a modern Orthodox area where the, you know, it always matters how the Goyim, so to say, view the Jews, uh, but to say like, you know, saying like, Luke, real Judaism is getting as drunk as possible so that you can't tell the difference between Haman and Mordecai. It is your obligation. You're a convert to Orthodox Judaism. Like you're not going to lose your conversion because you don't get that drunk. But like, yes, that's what we do. If you truly want to celebrate and feel for them, you're supposed to get that drunk. So it's okay, like, you know, if you're in a place where there's a lot of negative values on the Jews, you might not want to portray that message. And you want to say, like, no, I mean, we're not backwards. We're not drunken uh, people. But, like, in Brooklyn, um, where Jews run our own neighborhood and there's ethnic, like, there are no WASP. There, you know, like, they're saying there's no real English speakers. They're saying Crown Heights. Our neighbors are... Um, you know, whoever the African American Caribbeans in, in uh, Borough Park, the neighbors are, you know, Chinese, uh, Arab, uh, Dominican, Italian, um, Jews are, are relatively publicly, you know, drunkards in the sense, at least on the holidays, not really drunkards. I'm saying like Jews don't really get drunk besides on Purim, but it was saying like, yeah, we always have alcohol at our events and it's part of uh, the religion and saying the state usually never caused any problems. And even on Purim, um, you know, there's usually police all over the place, you know, especially now with security and the, you know, like in L.A. probably also 
um, but certainly in New York or Israel, you know, like even the Goyish police in New York, they understand it's Purim and that Jews are going to be so drunk that they're losing their mind. Um, but that's okay. That's our religion. And that's how it's portrayed. The police officers in Brooklyn who are in Hasidic neighborhoods, they like, this is the Jewish religion. This is how Jews celebrate. Um, and we could do that because, uh, you know, numbers and power as we're in L.A., um, you know, Jews might not have that much power in L.A. relative to New York like that, where we could be like, yes, this is this is our Judaism. This is how we want to celebrate it. And we demand uh, legal exemption. Well, there's certainly been occasions in, in L.A. when Orthodox Jewish kids have gotten drunk and, and blocked traffic. It created uh, public uh, disruptions. Uh, you could even call it a Hillul Hashem. The, the police have had to be called. Uh, but uh, Jews do have a lot of influence in, in Los Angeles. So we have something like uh, 600,000 Jews in Southern California. We have a pretty substantial Orthodox Jewish community of about 50,000 Jews in Southern California, probably about uh, 40,000 Jews, Orthodox Jews in, in Los Angeles. So uh, what about the hanging of Haman? This is sometimes disturbed uh, non-Jews that uh, in Brooklyn, for example, there will be you know, effigies of Haman and his sons getting getting hung. Have you ever seen this? Yeah, I saw that a few times. And, and you know, there's definitely religious um, precedent for such a thing. I don't know, you know, like, I'm not sure if I've seen, like, I've never seen a respectable rabbi uh, do it. But, like, if you're in a larger Orthodox area, like, people will do it. Um, you know, usually they're troubled people who do it. But, but it's within the line of the holiday and then there'll be like rabbis be like well yeah that is kind of what the the books say and uh and, and you know just to mention the the difference between uh, la and new york like half glitz and saying jews have a lot more power in new york than la and i, I did as a businessman my, my parnasa for a while was building permits and i did it more for uh commercial uh developers construction people um, but I knew the Hasidim that did it for um, the 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 synagogues. And, and Hasidim, there's multiple synagogues and groups that are more than powerful enough to get streets shut down and have police protection. So if you're in Borough Park, even if you're like a minor, like one of like 300 synagogues, you don't not even like, you know, bub of a huge Hasidus, even just like a normal synagogue, could get the streets shut down. Even young Israel near my house, uh, we had the streets shut down. We had police protection. So, you know, Purim, you'd have to purposely be making trouble. Like, I would assume in LA that it's no problem in most areas getting the streets shut down and even having police out there. And if some yeshiva students were drunk blocking traffic, it was because they were idiots because, uh, you know, there's no reason for that. Yes, uh, that's true. So, what do you make of uh, no mention of God in the book of Esther? I mean, you, if you want to answer that, you can, if you just the generic answer. No, I don't, I don't have a generic answer. So what's your answer? Um, well, I mean, the lesson is kind of God behind a providence that uh, th there's a multiple understandings and we've talked about this before one of them is dispensational that it was a, a different dispensation than among the earlier prophets where um you know we're, we 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 know that mordechai and esther or at least mordechai is a is a prophet where i think we're told that um but we're not filled in on any of the conversation between god and mordechai god isn't even mentioned in it and the actions of it are kind of behind the scenes and we only know about it because, you know, because the book, presumably, because uh, Mordecai is telling us this and in a prophetic way that uh, it's more like God's message in whatever way Jews understand that. Um, but as opposed to most of the books of the prophets is like in God speaks and says, tell the people this, uh, there's no mention of God. Um, so, the you know, the basic lesson is that God is there even when you don't see him, that you don't need a prophet, or, you know, like the leader to then God told me that God... Uh, you know, works behind the scenes or through the leaders of the Jewish community uh, for our benefit um, in all circumstances. And that's possibly, you could say it was a dispensation that it was uh, always, that it was used to be like that. It used to not be like that. 
and then at a certain time, uh, the level of prophecy or communication of God got less. Some, I think, people say because it didn't happen in Israel, because the book of uh, Esther occurs in Persia, and so some people explain that the prophecy or style is, you know, more uh, due to that. And uh, you, you know, there's multiple explanations, but uh, you know, usually that's also kind of the secret of Purim and anti-Semitism in general, is saying like there is a God, and God works behind the scenes, and uh, like we're gonna win because God's on our side. And uh, you, you know, saying like you could make fun of it and saying that even you know me myself like I, that's not how I explain Judaism, but in a simplistic way, you could look at it as like yeah, we're gonna win. God's on our side. That's the message of the Purim story. Trust the leadership. Trust the plan. Now, one of the frustrations I had talking to Adam Green is that he seems to look at uh, Judaism as Christianity without Christ. And so I wasn't able to communicate with him that there are all sorts of teachings and rabbinic sayings and doctrines within Judaism that don't necessarily play much of a role in, in the ordinary lives of Jews. For example, the, the doctrine of the Messiah. It's definitely a, a key uh, dogma, a key teaching in Judaism. But I, I think I've been in, in Jewish life for nearly 30 years, and I don't recall ever having a serious uh, discussion of the Messiah with any Jew. It's, it's not really something on the lips of most Jews. It's not something that they think about. So any, any responses to what I just said? Yeah, well, Hasidim definitely think about it more. And when you have a role of a Rebbe, where the Rebbe is supposed to be some sort of proto-Messianic figure, and you know Chabad maybe to a you know the largest degree, um, but any large Hasidic group where the Rebbe is this you know international, um, larger than life proto-Messianic figure, where you could picture that Messiah is going to be something like um, our Rebbe, and I'm not sure like in Los Angeles you might not have people that are. Orthodox or Haredi like that who gather and have large tishes and gatherings regularly where you would look at any of the you know, major rabbis or even uh, Hasidic rabbis as like a proto uh, messianic figure. But I, I would assume even in LA, even like, uh, you know, your local rabbi, the Talmud itself says that, you know, your local rabbi at your local synagogue, you should look at in some sort of proto uh, messianic way. And so if you're more Hasidic or Kabbalistic, you say it's happening behind the scenes, whether people realize it or not. If you know, like you go, you might not think about Messiah, but you go to your rabbi, and your rabbi is a proto-messianic figure, and your rabbi is connected into international Jewry in a way that you may not know or be capable of understanding. Then it's definitely, you know, sort of say like behind the scenes, um, like that, where the rabbi is like a vehicle, or you have leaders of the Jewish community that are a vehicle to the larger global Jewish world, what's happening in Israel. Like, God forbid, you know, when Israel's at war and you have like briefings of, uh, you know, what's the, on the scene in Israel or, or when there's anti-Semitism, you know, the leaders of the community have to come out and brief the community about uh, the threat of anti-Semitism or something like that, um, where you have a concept of this proto-Messianic figure who wins for the Jews. You know, like we expect the Jews are a small people and we're persecuted and we're not really liked, but we believe like that, you know, like that uh, somehow we're going to win anyways. And, uh, you know, but, and that's because we look at our leaders as proto messianic figures. I don't know if you, you know, you, you ever thought about it like that. Uh, I understand that that's the way some people think about it. It's not, it's not a way that I have uh, thought about it now. On, on Purim, it's very rare to encounter an Orthodox Jew who's not in a happy and generous frame of mind. Is that is that fair to say? It's required. I'm saying, like, if you're a believer in Judaism and you're normally a miserable, unhappy, mean person, you're required to fake it and try your best to be happy on Purim. You know, saying like it's like uh, you know the sukkah. It's it's just a mitzvah. You know, it's like putting on tefillin. Uh, it comes. And there's a requirement to do it. And, you know, saying like, I have a disposition that is uh, the opposite of that. It's hard for me saying it's porn. You have to try it. It's a mitzvah. It's a requirement. Now, uh, many strange things in the book of Esther. One is that uh, a, a nice Jewish girl, Hadassah, Esther, becomes caught up in this beauty pageant. She becomes one of a long 
train of women who spend the night with the king. This this seems completely contrary to traditional strict uh, Jewish sexual morality. How how does this happen, and how does this you know get uh, put in the Bible? Because the you know Hashem, the you know biblical the narrative of the sages are people who understand the material world for what it is. So there's the recommended behavior, and then there's the flawed behavior of even from the better of us. So you know things like. Uh, you know, minor sins, so it's even major sins, God forbid, most people commit them multiple times over their life. And so when the Torah says this is the proper behavior, there's no exemption. The Torah is very clear about what is right or wrong, but the Torah, you know, it's not, it's not for dummies. Like the, the Torah knows that people don't follow the rules. People make bad decisions. That's why we have a repentance process. And even, you know, Purim is like Yom Kippur, um, you know, the famous uh, Torah, like I'm sure you've heard that before, that uh, uh, Yom Kippur, they say is like Yom Kippurim. And, and so some of the Kabbalists will say that Purim is even higher than um, Yom Kippur itself because because uh, Purim will be uh, you know, the ultimate forgiving of sins. That the Torah knows people make serious, serious mistakes and it causes bad karma, it causes conflict, and people escalate conflict, people kill each other, um, people, all these things, the Torah is well aware of it. And so there's no contradiction when the Torah says that people engage in extremely bad behavior. That's the message of the Torah is saying that uh, we have free will and you have the right, the opportunity to engage in good or bad behavior. And uh, and then it gives a moralistic uh, message. Usually the good guys win in the end. Yeah. Now we, we were going to talk a little bit about COVID and Orthodox Jews so we're about a year into COVID. Uh, Orthodox Jews tend to have large families, so probably four or five kids would be about average among American Orthodox Jews. So Orthodox Judaism is a very communal religion, and I would suspect that Orthodox Jews are much less likely to engage in social distancing. So I, I wonder how much the Orthodox Jewish lifestyle has been affected, particularly in the United States over the past year, has there been a disproportionate impact of COVID on Orthodox Jews and uh, how will they move forward? Any thoughts on COVID and Orthodox Jews? Yeah, or I just mentioned if I sound a little irritable, it's because uh, I'm fasting. I had a little bit of uh, liquid that I want to get sick. But, uh, you know, uh, because Purim is, uh, you know, God forbid, it's almost a tragedy. It's a tragedy that uh, was averted behind the scenes by, you know, Jewish leaderships and prophets and Hashem's miracles but because it was uh you know almost a tragedy uh we're supposed to fast today so if i was a little irritable to, uh you know because so hopefully luke if he's fasting uh as an easy fast uh also so uh covid19 um like i said but when it first started you, you know like the strategy of having a bunch of kids that it'll be unlikely or you know i think i said this uh, when it first started we talked uh, at the beginning and think my predictions have largely been correct that Orthodox Jews will do quite a bit to do social distancing. You'll see some mask wearing, you'll see you know, like some uh, plastic things and some more hand washing and things like so from an Orthodox Jewish Hasidic perspective, they've changed their life substantially in terms of social distancing. But in terms of what like the CDC is recommending, it's not even close. And uh, Orthodox Jews probably suffered extremely disproportionately bad, possibly even worse than African Americans from COVID-19. When the numbers are all all through, God forbid, maybe tens of thousands of, of, of uh, Jews in, in America will have died from it, and, uh, and and probably half of them maybe will be Orthodox Jews. So the, you know, like the, we you've seen papers, the numbers. Um, you, you know, there's probably reasons why the leaders of the Jewish community feels not good to release that, and, and uh, it might. Uh, especially that Orthodox Jews are tending to uh, you know, realize that they're, they're just not going to be able to keep social distancing. That's not the strategy they want to employ. If the government is trying to force them to do it, um, they're in opposition to that. And from their perspective, uh, that's not the strategy that they think they should be uh, employing. And you know, I saw Kim Iverson was talking about Florida versus California, where basically California has always you know, been locked down and Florida has been open. 
um, but California is uh, just as bad as Florida. But but because Jews live in urban areas, Jews, you know, like we're respiratory people. We talk all day. Um, and we probably also have a lot of comorbidities, things like uh, diabetes, being overweight, um, you know, like God forbid, in the Orthodox Jewish community, especially the more Orthodox, maybe modern Orthodox, uh, you know, might you know belong to a gym or be more fit. But like, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of health comorbidities, a lot of uh, diseases that disproportionately affect Jews that unquestionably the Jewish community, the Orthodox Jewish community has taken a substantially big hit in terms of deaths but uh, and, and uh, sickness and effects. Um, but, you know, God forbid, you know, like you're not going to say a person with a bunch of kids loves their kids less, um, but that's the strategy. Uh, and, and that's the idea of having a bunch of kids. And uh, Orthodox Jews are probably right that they were able to largely weather the storm with the, uh, you know, what, what, what they did increasing social distancing. And they may have, uh, let's say five times as many Orthodox Jews die than as secular Jews. Like, you know, people like me who basically quarantined uh, for a year straight. And it could be that, uh, you know, from Reformed Jews who, who live in suburbs that Orthodox Jews are going to die at a, at a rate five times more. Um, but they largely maintained their lifestyle, um, got through it, and God forbid, because they have big numbers, they could take the f fatalities. And, 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 you know, so I wouldn't put that like no Orthodox Jewish leader is going to get up and, and say, like, you know, let, let's take the strategy because we have uh, big families that can afford to take the hits. But from a, you know, like a basic biological or strategic level, it, it makes sense that if you had big families that you would, uh, you know, look at it differently and take a different strategy. Yes. Okay, uh, David, this is great. Any any final words for today? Yeah, happy Purim. So uh, in like an hour here, sun's going down. And uh, you know, if you're a believer, you know, that uh, it's the prayer and the mitzvahs on Purim that cause good things to happen to us the rest of the year. So uh, like in the capitalist right, the reason, you know, I mean, you should give money to the poor people um, because uh, that's the right thing to do. Uh, but, you know, the Kabbalist will say, like, it's a karmatic mechanism that it causes good things to come to a person who engage in these behaviors. So you're saying a lot of Jews are superstitious and saying, like, okay, I'm going to give money to the poor because it's a mitzvah I'm required to. Like, no, because I believe in superstition and because I know God's going to pay me back 100 times full for what I give today versus on a normal day. And uh, there's and, and even anti-Semitism that uh, from a pure belief perspective like we read the book of megillah and whether the jews win or the anti-semites win that's determined by god on porn that's the meaning of the holiday and like obviously we're rational people and you know but it was saying from a superstitious pure pure believing level i mean there's rosh hashanah but generally like when you go to synagogue and you read the megillah uh, and you're thinking about that like god is going to decide whether the jews win or the anti-Semites win. I don't know if you look at it that way. Um, yeah, that's great. Okay, yeah, thanks, David. Thanks for powering through during a difficult day of uh, Jewish fasting prior to the festivities tonight. I'll talk to you later, my friend. Okay, happy Purim. Okay, happy Purim to David. All right, let's uh, have a look here. In-person education is apparently white supremacy. We have to give the teachers, we have to give the students, the parents a date. Of what at least we don't have to we don't have to give anybody any date <laughs> we don't have to do anything that we don't want to do right now that's what you don't understand i don't know where you're getting our information or who's telling you that we have to make a decision today but that is not how this works we do not i know that you're new to the school board i'm not saying this is a slight to you but we do not have to make a decision today 70 to 80 percent of them have answered the survey they want to come back to school so this is what we're well, the 70 to 80 percent and where are they i would like to know geographically from which school sites which language group and how we conducted this feedback where please give it to me before i can make a decision i can't make one i cannot make one and i will not make one you're welcome to abstain i, I believe right there's no reason to be nasty with me miss riley and we can present it for vote. And Charter, if you wish to vote no, you are more than welcome to, or you can. I know what I'm welcome to do, you guys, I do. 
And I know that what we're doing is wrong. So how are we forcing people? That seems like a very white supremacist ideology to force people to comply with, you know, a conform. <laughs> Just letting you know. Privilege. Check it, you guys. I'm at. So I don't want to be a part of forcing anybody to do anything they don't want to do. That's what slavery is. I'm not going to be a part of it. Powerful, powerful, powerful. What's going on here in uh, Brooklyn? A religious display in Borough Park is raising some eyebrows, but Jewish people in the neighborhood say otherwise. They say their Purim display is just a symbol of a miracle for the Jewish people and is nothing offensive. News 12's Enrique Correa was on the scene and has more. People in the predominantly Hasidic Jewish area of Borough Park were celebrating the last day of Purim, but this display of 11 mannequins being hung across 12th Avenue has offended some people. News 12 was contacted by a viewer about the hanging men, plus people walking by the religious display said it offends them, but they also didn't know what the Purim holiday means. Another neighborhood in that was done, people would have comments to say about that. I don't know, I think it's kind of like ridiculing. That's how I would see it. However, some of the people celebrating the Purim holiday say otherwise. They say the 11 mannequins represent a miracle for the Jewish people. We tried reaching out to the rabbi of the synagogue, but he was unavailable. However, the religious display is about an evil king and his 10 sons who were hung for trying to persecute the Jews. A man named by the name Haman, and he wanted to kill all the Jews. And um, in the end, they hanged hang him and all his sons instead. So that's just a, c a celebration that we celebrate that this was the story that happened in the past. Even though some people say they're offended by the 11 mannequins hanging behind me, but people in the neighborhood say you shouldn't be offended at all. It's just part of their Purim celebration. Reporting from Borough Park, I'm in... Yeah, the guy's lynching is just part of Purim celebration. You shouldn't get all upset about it. I mean, why can't you party like uh, Cory Booker and uh, Sh Shmuley Boteach here at uh, Chabad House at Oxford University? Like, why can't everyone just party like this? I get a lot of time about lynching, man. Yeah, it's not really such a big deal. It's like it's religious. We just you know, put up uh, mannequins to, to lynch on Burr. I always thought he was setting me up for something. Let's get the black guy to do something. <laughs> really yeah. I walked into my first Pearl party ever, and, and I'm, not, I'm telling the truth here. I walk into my Pearl party, and I see a line of people lying on the floor. And he says, okay, Gordon, we're going to jump over the... I go, what kind of crazy tradition is this? Jump a Jew? I, I mean, let's, let's find the black guy and the jump the Jew. Oh, this is bad. Oh, this is bad. You had these kind of jumping abilities. That you wish your people would go like this. This is my type of religion. This is why I converted. Boy, when, when, it, when it came time for me, I was able to jump eight obese Jews. Beast Jews, that's when I was in my 20s, and I didn't, I didn't make a, a third of myself like that. Just, I cleared like eight, eight, 300 plus pound Jews, and it came time for me to make the big jump. I had to clear eight of these Jews before they convert me. Shmuley and uh, Cory Booker. 
Parties are, I always thought he was setting me up for something. Let's get the black. Okay. Let's uh, pull it together here, 40. What's, what's next on the list? Howard Stern. Nope. Let's go with Michael Savage here. Michael Savage getting a call from an Orthodox Jew, I believe. I like Paul from WABC. What's your, uh, what's your gripe, Paul? Savage, I'd like to wish you a happy Purim. And I noticed that today... Can you do me a favor? Stop. You're calling to complain now. You're making believe you're calling. But go on, please. No, oh, I'm just going to wish you happy perm. And I know it's very easy to get a hold of you because a lot, this today because not a lot of Orthodox Jews are listening. So I want to wish you happy perm. And I would like you to come to my house for Shabbos because... Can I, you stop with this personal garbage already? Stop it. I don't know you from a hole in a wall. So what are you calling about? What, what, what purpose is your life other than to argue that politics is boring and this is that? Just come and find Judaism. You're searching. Will you stop already with the Purim already? I'm not four years old with a hat on my head eating sweets. Stop with the old holidays that have no meaning. You got a Haman in the White House and you're talking about King Haman like a fool. Why don't the Orthodox Jews wake up already to the real, the real Haman in the White House? Scream and yell, scream and yell. What, why are you celebrating the overthrow of someone in Persia a thousand years ago? What does that do for you? Because the Jews were able to, what, what does that do for us? Because the Jews were able to survive and live again and do mitzvahs, which makes the world a better place. Dr. Really? And what's going on now? What are the Jews doing today? God in this world. You always say, Dr. Savage, that there's God. No, no, you're not answering me. You're living in the past. You're living in a fable. You're living in a fantasy like you're four years old. What is the point of getting drunk on Purim? What are you celebrating? We're celebrating that we survived so we could be able to serve God with, with insurance. Oh, wonderful. I'm glad you're serving God. Then why don't you serve God with the truth? And why don't you work to overthrow King Haman in the White House? But because how we try. People try. How, what can we do to overthrow King Haman in the White House, Dr. Savage? Well, how about talking about it? How about talking about how abusive he is and how he is the worst friend of Israel in the history of the presidency? Why did you support him? We don't, I don't support him. I can't stand him. I support Donald Trump. What does that mean, support him? I, I don't know who, very few people support him. Very few Orthodox Jews support him. I don't know about George Soros and the liberal leftists. Oh, all right. Oh, good. You're making a clear defining line. I forced you to think today instead of getting drunk on, on mushka and dancing like a four-year-old and then eating sweets and going into a diabetic coma. So I did a, a mitzvah for you. When you sit and you hide with your dog all day, stop it already. You're not going to do anything. The reason why we start by perm is because it's a, it's a, it's a nace that happened to the Jewish people and that it's nonsense to live in the past that's my opinion live in the present better you'll do better in life celebrate something about today instead of yesterday and please don't make the Holocaust your whole your whole existence see this is my problem with the whole Jewish uh, uh, thing is that you define the religion today by events that occurred so long ago that have no meaning you talk for example at Passover about how Jews were slaves in Egypt right why don't you talk about the slaves right now in the Middle East who are being enslaved by Muslims? Maybe that would be something that the liberals ought to put into their Haggadah. How, how this president enables the kidnapping and enslavement of Yazidis and uh, non-Muslims in the Middle East. Then I would say the religion has, has some relevance today. Otherwise, it's just an ossification uh, uh, of no meaning whatsoever. That's why so many young people are running away from it. They want meaning. They want presence. They want knowledge. It doesn't mean the religion has to be defined by the past, does it? 
Religion doesn't have to be defined by the past. Religion definitely has to be defined by the past. What, what would it be if that, if, without our forefathers? Without, what do you, I'm sorry. You're, you're saying that religion has to be defined by the past. should not be defined by the past. Of course it should be defined by the past. How else, how else would we be able to look back at what the greatness of what our forefathers did? And accomplished? Yeah, but if you keep looking back, how are you going to move forward? If religion, if everything's about the present, Dr. Savage, then what is your life? You have no life. You, you don't look to your forefathers. You basically don't believe there's anything to celebrate about the past. So your whole life is San Francisco. You go Well, I, I don't believe in, in marching around talking about King Haman being overthrown and eating rotten candy and drinking cheap vodka with a bunch of people dancing about the past. No, I don't. Now, if that gives you meaning, God bless you. We live in a crazy country, so if you want to keep dancing and holding hands and going in circles and dancing about King Haman, I'm not going to say anything about it, but I think you're being foolish. Talk about King Haman in the White House abusing America today and abusing the world today. Then I would say the religion has some meaning right now. Thank you for the call. I'll be right back. Okay, Michael Savage to Howard Stern. And once a year, my parents would get religious. All of a sudden, they never went to the temple. Once a year on this fucking Yom Kippur. They didn't do the Rosh Hashanah thing, too? Uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. And the reason they went is because all their friends went. They went to tell me, all look at each other's outfits and goof on each other. <laughs> <laughs> and my father would be super Jew on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. And the hypocrisy was ridiculous. I mean, what, what are you, what, why are you super Jew two days out of the year? What is it? Because you think God is... You really think God He's going to ignore what you did the rest of the right, year. Right, And if you come in these two days, oh, you're okay with me. Oh, then my old man would start fasting. And I think they wanted me to fast. Did you ever? I guess I did. I mean, I remember being miserable. With my father, his breath would be terrible. My mother's breath, because they were all fasting. When you fast, you don't eat anything. You can't have drink water. You no toothpaste. Oh, you don't toothpaste. <laughs> yeah, because I stink. I want to meet girls. Your life's over, not mine. And he'd be miserable, more miserable than usual. <laughs> Sit all day in the fucking temple. In a, in a and what would you do? Oh, I, I would just fidget and just be miserable. Could you, like, I bring books? Or? No, 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 no. You sit there and read. I, I always bring books. Like, I, I'll bring, like, three books on, on Yom Kippur. If I'm going to be in shore for eight hours straight, I'm going to have a lot of books. But they'll all be Jewish books. They're not going to be, you know, goyish books. They're not going to be, you know, silly books. They're serious Jewish books, guys. So Laponius Meridius Maximus is here. Laponius, I don't have as many friends because I'm not as pretty as I was. I've kicked myself at times because I've lied. So I will have to learn to stand my ground. I'll tell them I won't be around. I'll move on over to your town and hide. Laponius, you be the captain. I'll be no one. And you can carry me away if you want to, no homo. And you can lay low just like your father. And if I tread upon your feet, you just say so. Laponius, because you're the captain, I am no one. I tend to feel as though I owe one to you. Well, I've handed all my efforts in. I've searched here for my second wind. Is there somewhere here to let me in? I asked. So I slammed the doors. They slammed at me. I found the place I meant to be. I figured out my destiny at last. Did I forget to thank you for the ride? I hadn't tried. I tend to run away and hide. And read this language no one understands. No one knows what they're reading. There's no interpretation. Even my mother said, you know, I really don't get much out of it. <laughs> but they keep, and, and they keep torturing me with it. Well, if you don't get anything out of it. Oh, and about uh, reading physics books at Shul, Asia Carrera would bring uh, physics books to the pawn set. And she'd read physics books on the pawn set. They all make up their own rules. I call my mother. I tell, when, when, on, uh, on Young Kipper, you say to somebody, good Yantav. Uh -huh. Don't ask me what that fucking means. <laughs> I just say it. Or Lashana Tova Tekka That's Tegel. Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, I don't know what the difference. I went through 900 million hours of, of services and training, and I don't even know what that means, but Yantav. Or your Lashana Tova. Lashana Tova Tekka Tegel. I mean, it's nonsense. It's a secret language. For who? I don't know who they're doing this for. Don't torture me. I'm an American. I'm, I love English. I'm a, I'm a wordsmith. And if you've got something to tell me, tell me in my language that I can understand. So I called my mother. Good Yantav. Oh, look who it is. Hello. You called her and said good Yantav? I don't know what I said. I said, yeah. <laughs> Shema, you going to Temple? What? You going to Temple? <laughs> Um, yeah, well, tomorrow your father and I, I mean, uh, we're going to go to Temple. And the Temple of Oz, the, the PA system is very bad. I can't hear anything. <laughs> I said, listen, Ma. What? I said, Mom, you have to get a hearing aid. Yeah, it's not the PA system. Listen, it's not, listen, I know my hearing isn't perfect. <laughs> but that PA system, after all, they have no money there and they don't fix it. And you can't hear anything. I go, what's the difference if you can hear everything? You don't know what they're talking about anyway. <laughs> it's something to do you know, with it's it. it's true. But I can't hear. I said, why don't you move up front? Oh, please. How can I move up front? Uh, I, I, everything I say doesn't make any <laughs> sense. None of it makes sense. So my father and her sit there. They can't hear a fucking thing. <clears throat> but you say they couldn't understand it anyway. It's all a joke. My mother doesn't read Hebrew. She doesn't know how to read Hebrew. She doesn't understand it. And my father sits there and he, he prays. But he, if you heard him speak the Hebrew, he doesn't <laughs> even know what he's talking about. I, he, I don't know who taught him. 
I'm the only one who actually is capable of reading it because I had all this stupid training. A lot of good it did me. Oh, my goodness. So, so, Ma, are you going to fast? What? Are you going to fast? Fast? <laughs> well, look, your father and I, after all, we're old. So now they got to buy on the fast? Well, 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 listen, this is, this is, everyone makes up their own religion. <laughs> uh, so, you know, a lot of our friends. So uh, I used to work a lot of temp jobs between 1995 and 1997 before the big blogging bucks started rolling in. And I wasn't quite in reality. I'm, I, I did some embarrassing things. I remember on some of the temp jobs, I would, uh, I'd share copies of What Women Want, my 1996 magnum opus uh, movie production extravaganza. And... Uh, I tended not to get invited back on those jobs. Like some of them were going to possibly turn into full-time jobs, but like there are complaints. I, I guess they, they didn't like the quality of the movie. I, I also, I gave a copy of the movie to my psychotherapist. Like I thought it would help her understand me. Like these are my, you know, my deepest, darkest fantasies, you know, portrayed for, for the world to see. And, and she accepted the copy, but she never did look at it. And then I took a box of the movies to, Stephen S. Wise Temple and handed them out to all my friends at uh, Stephen S. Wise Temple. I remember Dennis Prager said, oh, wow, in, in New York, when I get a show, they give me a talus, but in Los Angeles, they, they give me a porno. But uh, I was not as discreet with this movie as I should have been. I, I finally came to my senses about uh, year 2000. I made this uh, good Orthodox Jewish friend, and he said, you should destroy every copy of that movie in your possession. And uh, I had to agree with him. So later on, he said, let me tell you about the feeling in our house. I don't trust you. My wife hates you. Our kids fear you. But at least he gave me some good direction with what to do with my spare copies of what women want. They're older. They take medications. And you know, they don't. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> and, you know, it's hard to... Uh, it's right, Mom. When you, uh, when you uh, take medication, you're supposed to eat with it. What is that? I said when you take medication, you're supposed to eat. Well, you know, you're supposed to eat when you take medication. So. <laughs> uh, what about... Um, so what are you going to do? Well, we're going to go to Temple. We're not going to eat breakfast. And when we get home from Temple in the afternoon, we're going uh, to eat. I go, yeah, but you're supposed to wait till sundown. Right, but your father and I rolled it now. So. It'll be sundown somewhere. Okay, so what is the point in waiting? Why not eat breakfast? And if it doesn't really make a difference, why fast at all? Right. And uh, Mitch McConnell has just been interviewed on Fox News. He says that if Donald Trump is the nominee of the Republican Party in 2024, that Mitch will support him. Well, I get this religious paranoia because I went through so much religious training that literally I, I sit there and I, like, like, like Saturday, I was like, I'm going to eat breakfast. And then I have this interview debate. Gee, should I be eating breakfast? I'm going, what the fuck am I talking about? You're not going to Temple. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. That's it. Yeah. I'm eating. Good. I oh. ate. I ate lunch. And you're still here. Yeah. <laughs> I felt guilty. I did. Well, that's ridiculous. Everyone does their own thing, though. So, so does God look at my parents in the same way he looks at me and go, well, he didn't, he didn't go to Temple. He didn't eat. I mean, he ate and he didn't go to Temple. The parents went to Temple, but they ate early. I got to kill them all. Like, is that what he does? I don't know how uh, it works. It, well, it looks to me like God isn't paying attention. Yeah. Because think, you've been not observing for a long time. You're still here. I just think being a good person and trying to do your best. Oh, no. From what I understand, with these religions, that doesn't count. Right. You, gotta, you either got to bow or be right. on a special... Right. you got to do it in the service of your maker. Yeah. Well, I don't know why I had to go to all that religious training. My parents are barely religious themselves. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know why, what possessed them to put me in that situation. A lot of parents do that, though. You yeah. know, it's like, make sure... In fact, haven't you noticed most people don't even get religion until they get children? Yeah. And yeah. then it's like the children really get the religion. Yeah. What's the point? All right, you want to give your kid a sense of God or something? Or okay. tradition or whatever. So go to like a reformed kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Mel Gibson saw What Women Want, and it influenced his movie of the same title. But you can even more profoundly see the influence on Mel in the, well, the Passion of the Christ. So there, there's a very direct line between Apricot Sky, my version of What Women Want, and then Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ situation where they give you a little bit of religion and give you a little exposure to it. Whatever. Or find something that you actually believe in. I remember the second year of Hebrew school, and they, you know, because all this was leading up to this big bar mitzvah. If you don't go to Hebrew school, you won't be bar mitzvah. And like, if you don't get bar mitzvah, you know, what, the, you know, what happens to you? It's a big party. But what happens if you don't get bar mitzvah? Uh, you don't get the party. Oh. That was the way I understood it. It's a huge party. <laughs> it's my, just for the party. Where my mom and dad invited all their friends and they all got dressed up and celebrated me being 13 years old. They couldn't give a shit about me. I don't think half of them even knew my name. I was just some little shit that hung around with my parents. It was an opportunity to get yeah. some food and some booze. And I don't know. My, my dad didn't seem all that proud anyway. Just bitching about how much it cost. <laughs> you know, and they didn't invite his partners. He didn't even want there. Whole thing was just a fiasco. The place I had my bar mitzvah burned down. 
I'm surprised I didn't burn it down. <laughs> <laughs> I think they burned it down for the insurance money or something. I don't know. I don't know what happened there. But yeah, the second year Hebrew school, I had a smelly Hebrew school teacher. This guy smelled so bad when he would walk over and he'd go, Sleep. then the name stopped. You know, it was just fake. I thought it had something to do with Howard. It had nothing. It was randomly pulled out of this guy's ass. I, and this teacher smelled so bad. I couldn't figure out if he shit his pants, if Ugh. it was his breath. His fingers even smelled. It was, it, it was intoxicating. It permeated my entire being when I was in this room with this guy. And he would go, he would walk over and, and you had to write in a little blue book all your Hebrew letters right. and write words in Hebrew. What the fuck I was doing there, I don't know. And he'd go, Sleep. and he, he'd start pointing to my book with his fingers, Sleep. and as he said, Sleep. the breath would come out <laughs> and it would knock you out. I, w- I was dizzy and headachey because first of all, there was nothing to eat. After school, you're hungry when you're a kid. You just spent all right. fucking days. You in just school. only had lunch at noon, and now it's. So I remember when I was in acting, when you'd audition for for a role, they'd always give you a, a sheet, and they'd ask you if you're willing to do full frontal nudity, if you're willing to, you know, be nude from the back. So I always had no nudity, you know, no homo, no nudity. That was how I rolled in Hollywood, and I remember asking Dennis Prager like uh, one audition, it wanted me to kiss a dude. And and I said, you know, Dennis, like I, I could possibly justify this as just acting, but I'm really uncomfortable with this. And uh, Dennis Prager recommended to me that uh, no kissing dudes, e- even if it's just acting. And uh, I wonder. I remember one day at show, Dennis Prager said to me, "Oh, I, I hear you're bi." No, I, I'm not bi. He was just he was just teasing, guys. He was, he was just teasing. But I do remember 1997, I went to a roommate matching service to try to find a roommate. And they just automatically put me in the gay section. I didn't figure out, like, why was everyone I was calling, you know, why were they all gay? And uh, and one guy, he, he was like a professor of ethics at UCLA, but he didn't want me as a roommate because even though we had a great conversation about ethics, he didn't think that as a, a blogger that I'd earn a reliable uh, income to, to pay the rent. But yeah, I, I had like a dozen gay dudes who they matched me up with to try to find an apartment. I ended up getting an apartment with this one gay dude, and he used to run a nude cleaning service. He would send women who would uh, get naked and clean your house. He was on the, the Jerry Springer show, and... Uh, so, so I move in and I told him, look, I'm straight. I, I'm like, I'm totally straight. I mean, I'm, I'm straight in my thinking. I'm straight in my, my deeds, like no homo. And so I, I move in and then we go out and we watch the documentary on Al Goldstein. And then we come back and he cooks dinner. And then he like, he's lighting candles and, and like creating a certain mood, a certain atmosphere. It made me quite uncomfortable, but I think he was just teasing me. And then... A few weeks later, some, I, I, the door, there's a knock on the door. I open up the door, and there's some dude holding flowers. And it's like, oh, I, I think you want my roommate. And, and to, to get in the shower, like I had to go through his bedroom. So I, I had a job. And so I'd have to come through his bedroom about 6.30 a.m. And they would be like, you know, under the covers, you know, they'd just like have their arms around each other. But, you know, the 40 doesn't judge. So I, I told that roommate service, look, I'm not gay, all right? You know, I am not gay. I'm not gay in my thinking. I'm not gay in my loving. Like, no homo. And it's like, oh, sorry. They just, they just automatically assumed I was gay. Like, what the hell, man? Why, why would you even think that? Like, where does that come from? Three and four o'clock in the afternoon, you need yeah. a snack. Oh, that's, I, mean, what, I mean, no wonder I have the tuchus of a, of a, of a lamb. I have no muscles. In my <laughs> I should have been out playing a sport after school. No, I'm sitting on my ass yet again. No wonder they, my ass atrophied. You should see. You see my buttocks. Of course, it's a miracle I even have any muscle tone back there. Don't laugh at my ass because my entire childhood was spent sitting either in a classroom, a Hebrew school, or a regular school, and I'm resentful of it. Somebody should have stepped in and arrested my parents. <laughs> no. How do they do that these days? Do they still make kids go to I guess. Hebrew school every day after school? I was walking down the street in Manhattan. I saw some kids with the yarmulke and the, the curly cues and the, the Hasidic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They must be in Hebrew school 57 hours a day. All day, yeah, every all day. All day. I mean, I mean, they're completely brainwashed. I don't know. It should be against the law to brainwash kids. You know what? Let kids, when they turn 18, turn to religion if they want it. Oh, God, those kids were angry, too. I remember there was this Jewish neighborhood, like an Orthodox <laughs> Jewish neighborhood, between me and the library. And the Jewish kids with the payas yeah. and all the stuff, they erected, like, a toll booth <laughs> right. in their neighborhood. And they'd beat you up <laughs> if you didn't pay the toll to really? get through. Yeah. Wow. All I know is at 12 years old, I had the ass of an 85-year-old man. <laughs> <laughs> These kids weren't in Hebrew school. They were manning the toll booth. Well, <laughs> I would have rather manned the toll booth. It would probably have made more sense to me. It was crazy. Anyway. 
See, I sit around all weekend resentful. Well, especially on a holiday weekend. Yeah, holiday weekends <laughs> rile me up. But then Beth calms me down. That's her, that's her unique ability. You know, it's great. Do you ever talk to the therapist about how you feel about the holidays in your... No, I talk to you, actually. Oh. <laughs> Seems more I think this is something you should bring up. You have a lot of feelings here. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Evidently, I do. I didn't even realize it. Yeah. Mm. yeah a lot of resentments. Yeah. So I asked my mom if they tanked up on food before, you know. Right, do the big uh, feed. Father and I went to Kentucky Fried. We had our uh, chicken. <laughs> they love Kentucky Fried, my parents. And they're getting the grilled chicken now. They like the grilled chicken, yeah. They don't get the fried. Why go to Kentucky Fried? They love the grilled chicken. Love, love, love the grilled chicken. So what's so special about that grilled chicken? It's delicious. <laughs> and they serve it fast. It's terrific. <laughs> we love it. There are mostly black people in there. <laughs> and we love it. We love it. Well, you know. The other whites haven't discovered no, it. No, but it's great. We love it. Good. 